in the, in the final bit here, we're, we're going to think about, we can't focus on all of these issues, but I want to take euthanasia and then I want to take transgenderism and, and just use these as an examples about how you would talk about uh, these issues, um, both in the church and, and otherwise. And uh, the key arguments against euthanasia, we, we have to know them. And there are, there are, there are four key arguments that, that work. And as we go through these, you'll notice that the most important argument is not there at all. The most important argument against euthanasia is that it involves killing innocent people and human beings are made in the image of God and we must not shed innocent blood. That's the, the powerful argument coming from scripture. But it's not going to convince most people. So we need to look for arguments that will make them think. And these are the arguments that we've found in public policy really work and particularly the first one, and, and w when we were campaigning against a change in the law on euthanasia in Britain, we wanted an argument that would work with everybody, whether they were from the right wing or the left wing or whatever, and it was the victim argument. And so the argument is, if you change the law to allow euthanasia, then you'll put vulnerable people under pressure to request early death because they feel that they're a burden on others. Uh, and so, uh, and that would be a terrible thing to do. And so we shouldn't change the law because if we change the law to allow it in some circumstances, it will mean that certain people will be abused or exploited. And, and that argument won the day in Parliament again and again and again, whether people were from the right wing or, or the left. Uh, second argument, incremental extension is inevitable once you allow it. In other words, if you allow it for some people, elderly people with cancer or terminally ill or whatever, uh, you, you're already embarking on a situation where the categories will be extended. Some people call it the slippery slope. It's better to call it incremental extension because people will push the envelope. Uh, number three, requests for euthanasia are very rare when patients' needs are fully met. So in other words, if, you, if you're treating their pain and their anxiety and their fear and their nausea and so on, then people generally will not request euthanasia. So in other words, we should use the alternative of good care. And then the final argument, the law is clear and right and it war works, it tempers justice and mercy. That This might not work in all European countries, but in Britain it, it worked because uh, the thing was in the police were given a discretion in who to prosecute. And so it didn't mean that every person who was involved in any uh, questionable end of life acts would therefore go to prison for their whole life. But the police had to make a decision of do we bring a prosecution? Is it in the public interest to do so? Is there enough evidence to, to make it successful? Um, so the point is the best kind of law of all is one that says no killing at all under any circumstances. But when the cases come to court, there is discretion in which, in penalties and so on. So that, we'd say that, that mixes, that resonates with the Christian view of justice being tempered with mercy. Once you start making exceptions, you create, you encourage abuses. Now, let me use an analogy. If, if, the, um, if you have a, a speeding law which says you must not drive at more than 100 kilometers per hour unless you're a doctor going to an emergency, uh, a person who's late for a doctor's appointment, uh, your kids are late for school, and so on. You make all, all kinds of exceptions you're creating an unmanageable situation. But if you have a law that says you must not speed under any circumstances and someone's caught speeding and they say, oh, no, did you not realize I'm a doctor and there was, I was going to someone who was critically ill, then of course no one's going to convict in those circumstances. So the best laws are those which have a blanket prohibition and then give discretion to judges and, and so on to temper justice with mercy. So, so let's look at this. The point of this is that if you ask 
people, we did this in Britain, if you ask people, should assisted suicide be made legal, then 73% of people say yes. But if you say to them, if you bring the arguments against it, and you may not be able to see this, but you tell them, um, but people might feel pressured to ask for it if you change the law. Would that change your mind on the matter? And then the second one is, uh, when you legalize assisted suicide, you get a steady rise in the number of cases. Would that make you think twice about it? Well, the third one is, um, you know, it, it, it costs 4,000 euros um, a week to look after people at the end of life who've got cancer, but it only costs five euros for a lethal injection. Do you think if we legalized it, it might make uh, it an attractive proposition for politicians uh, about saving money on the health service? Would that change your mind about it? So this is, this is the way they did it. And when they raised all the objections, what started off as 73% ended up as 43%. In other words, people just haven't heard the arguments, and when they hear them, they'll often change their mind. Not everybody, but some will. So uh, just going through these, any change in the law to allow assisted suicide would place pressure on vulnerable people to end their lives for fear of being a financial, emotional, or care burden upon others, and would especially affect those who are disabled, elderly, sick, or depressed. So again, this is the, this is the victim argument. Okay, you, you may think it's your right to have euthanasia, but if we're going to change the law to allow it for you, it actually puts all these people in danger. Do you really want that? That was the argument that worked. Uh, incremental extension is inevitable. The, the two main arguments for euthanasia are compassion and autonomy. So compassion says the relief of suffering and autonomy is, it's my right. Those are the two main arguments. But uh, those arguments can be applied very, very widely indeed. So if you, if, you, if you say, okay, let's allow euthanasia, but only for people who are terminally ill within six months of death, who are adults and therefore mentally competent, uh, who don't have any mental health problems, uh, and, and uh, we'll only make it available for that. Then what will happen is that the next thing is people will bring the autonomy and compassion arguments for people outside those categories. So, okay, so I'm not within six months of death, but I have got a chronic disease. Are you saying I don't have a right? That's not fair. This person can have it, but I can't, you see. So the autonomy argument will come, or the compassion argument okay, I'm not terminally ill, but I've, I've got unbelievable pain. Are you saying that it's all right for this person, but not for me? That's not fair. And so once you make exceptions, you're creating a situation where people will push the boundaries. And what we've seen in countries where euthanasia has been made legal is that, is that you can't control it. You allow it for the terminally ill, it's not long before it's being applied for the chronically ill. If you allow it for physical conditions, it's not long till people are having it for mental illness. If you allow it for adults, it's not long before it's being asked for for children in similar circumstances. And so you, you, some people call it the slippery slope. I prefer to call it mission creep or incremental extension for the simple reason that it's people who are intentionally pushing the envelope, who are wanting to move the boundaries it's not happening passively like sliding down a slope. There's an agenda here. And when we look at countries like the Netherlands, Belgium, Canada particularly, we see inevitably, once you legalize it, you get an increase in the number of cases every year. You get it spreading to new categories of people who aren't provided by the law. And you get, most importantly, a change in the public conscience where people don't think it's uh, serious anymore. And this is exactly what happened with euthanasia, with abortion. If you go back 40 years, most people found the whole idea of abortion distasteful, but now we've got used to the idea that public conscience has changed. Uh, these are the Belgian figures, just to illustrate, um, since it was legalized back in 2003, 4 how it's gone up every year virtually. 
Uh, number, uh, number three argument, good palliative care is better. The, this uh, lady standing up is, is a professor of palliative medicine, uh, Laura Finlay, who is a member of the Upper House of Parliament in Britain and campaigned against euthanasia, and the lady sitting down is her mother. Uh, and, and the thing is, her mother wanted euthanasia, but she, she, uh, she said once we gave her the treatment that made her feel better, she didn't want it anymore. And that is, that is the, the reality. And so uh, Finley's argument was that we should make good care available. And disabled people's lobbies have been very strong on this. That they say, we're not, they'll say, we're not opposed to euthanasia in principle. In other words, we don't think it's always wrong to end people's lives. We're not Christians, you know, we don't believe in the um, image of God or whatever. But don't even think about legalizing it until we as disabled people have full equality with everyone else. Because if we don't, we're going to be exploited, we know we are. And they know secretly that they'll never have equality so that they can always use this argument uh, against it. Uh, so symptoms can be, be relieved, that's the point. Um, the, the, the palliative care doctor in our fellowship once said to me, you know, I, I've managed 20,000 dying patients and I could count on the fingers of one hand those who've asked for euthanasia after we treated them properly. Uh, and and the, the other reason is that the real reasons for wanting assisted suicide, when you look at countries which allow it, or states which allow it, are not medical. They're not to do with pain. They're to do with these kind of existential things, decreasing enjoyment of life, loss of autonomy, loss of dignity. Uh, we shouldn't be providing lethal injections for people for what are in reality uh, spiritual problems. And then this, this was just the argument of um, uh, discretion in the law. Now, th this this guy here, um, was uh, a a murderer who who killed a woman, cut her body in Britain. We have people like this in Britain, sadly. She he killed a woman, cut her body up into parts, and then distributed the parts all over the county. Uh, and he was arrested and they put him away for 20 years in prison. Now, this woman here was the mother of this girl who um, she had a condition which increasingly leading her to be paralyzed and her mother wanted to help to end her life and so in, in desperation one night she gave her an overdose of morphine. And, and the judges said, you know, you've broken the law, this is assisted suicide, but the sentence was far, far less than that. The, the point is that you give discretion to people to apply the law depending on the, on the case. Uh, we say the law has a stern face but a kind heart. In other words, d disability rights lobbyists will say that it's important that the penalties the law holds in reserve are strong because they deter people from doing bad things. But th that cases are treated with compassion when they're actually brought to court. So in other words, you don't change the law to say it's all right to kill in these circumstances. What you do is give the, you keep the law in place to stop people exploiting others, but then you apply it with discretion and, and uh, mercy. And then uh, this is the, the autonomy argument um, is, is the main one. The, the palliative care argument or the compassion argument isn't enough because you'll find alone if you say, well, we shouldn't change the law because, um, you know, we just need to treat people properly and then give them good care, then they won't want it. So we should be trying to get good treatment. Then the opposition will come back and say, okay, well, we believe in palliative care too. We think people should have good care. But actually there are some people for whom 
it's not enough and they, they really do want euthanasia. So, you know, you've got to change the law for these, these people, otherwise that's really unfair. And um, so this is the autonomy argument. And, and the, so to argue against the autonomy argument, uh, you know, so it's my right that the law should not uh, prevail here. Or you say, in, a, in any free society, we have laws. In, in any democratic society, we have laws because we believe there are limits to human freedom. Every single law stops some people doing what they desperately want to do. Uh, because, you know, I don't have a freedom to come around to your house and throw a brick through your window. And so in order to protect your freedom, you need it. So the point is we're not entitled to freedoms which endanger the reasonable freedoms of other people. Okay, so this is why we're happy generally to go to the airport and all take off our belts and our shoes and put our things, take our laptop computers out and we put them through the x-ray machines. Um, so we're happy to have our freedoms limited at the airport because we know this has been done in order to protect others. So we, we're, we willingly forego freedoms so others can be free and safe. And in the same way, uh, it's a powerful argument to say we shouldn't change the law even though there's some people who desperately want euthanasia because then that will remove freedoms from others. And so we should be willing to put up with uh, the freedom. In the same way, you know, we accept speed limits, don't we? We might, you know, we might love to sit in a convertible car driving at 300 kilometers per hour and fe feeling the wind going through our hair. But we, uh, I see people are nodding here, but, but we accept speed limits because we know that giving that freedom would actually endanger other people's freedom, that innocent people would be killed as a result of having that freedom. I told you we'd come to transgender, didn't I? Uh, there's no way we can deal with this subject in 20 minutes, but let me just give you some, some thoughts. Um, someone asked about books. I think this is one of the best books there is. When Harry Became Sally by Ryan Anderson. Uh, he's an American lawyer and um, uh, runs, runs a, a website called Public Discourse. Very bright guy. He's coming from a Catholic background, but he uses natural law arguments predominantly. And this is the review. Ryan Anderson's written the definitive book on the transgender phenomenon ranging across medicine, psychology, culture, sociology, law, and public policy. In doing so, he may have saved the minds and bodies, indeed the very lives of people he will never know. Um, it's a brilliant book. There's only one problem. You know what that problem is? No. You can't buy it on Amazon anymore. You know why? It's been banned because it's so-called hate speech. Uh, so this is what we're up against. I, I was saying in the break, I, I said I used to speak a lot on transgender stuff. I, I gave an annual lecture at an organization called Family and Youth Concern in the UK, and, and they recorded it and put it up on YouTube. This is in 2017. Um, about nine months later, it had 160,000 views on YouTube. It was on all aspects of transgender. And then it disappeared. If you go to the URL now, there's a sign which says this video has been removed because it constitutes hate speech. And I did a number of talks here at, at, um, at ELF a few years ago. They've all been taken off, not by ELF, that would be taken off by YouTube. You can't find them on the internet anymore. And, yeah, yeah, they're on, yeah. So, you know, because they're linked through to, yeah. to YouTube. 
And so when it happened, uh, we were thinking, what can we do about this? We realized we we're up against these huge multinationals who can do anything they like. One person makes a complaint, that's it. And so you can buy Ryan Anderson's book, you need to look for it, but you can't buy it on Amazon because the transgender lobby complained that it was hate speech and so they took it off. So anyway, a, a few thoughts on this. First of all, that we're dealing with two different issues. So we're dealing with transgender ideology, which is a false belief system attempting to shape morality, law, and society. Uh, the idea that that um, what I am is what I think I am, and that uh, that gender has no relation at all to biology. That's the idea of transgender ideology, and that, that's the sort of thing that's leading to uh, people being forced to use pronouns or being forced to cooperate with transgender treatments and giving hormones and referring people for or uh, for surgery and so on like that. And then the other entity is a condition called gender dysphoria where there's a dissonance between a person's biology and their beliefs. And that this is a very uh, distressing, real, recognized medical condition uh, that needs to be met with compassionate understanding and appropriate treatment. So it's important to realize the difference here because when you're having a discussion about this, you know, the question is, who am I talking to? Am I talking about someone who's personally suffering or has a relative who is? Uh, or am I talking to you know, an, an activist who wants to change the law and take away all human freedoms and stop Christians preaching in the, in the, in the, uh, even in their own churches? And, and the key question here is, is this one. Is, is a person with gender dysphoria, or what used to be called gender identity disorder, really a man in a woman's body, or vice versa, a woman, a woman in a man's body? Or are they just a woman with a, with a false belief that they are a man? That's the, that's the nub of the issue. And so what you decide about that question will influence what you think should be done. And let, let, let me just explain it like this. If a person believes and their biology are at odds with each other, then do we change the body to conform to the gender identity through giving puberty blockers, hormone treatments, surgery? Or do we change the identity to conform to the body through counseling, psychotherapy, and so on, so forth. Now, when I trained, the prevalent view in the medical profession was that you do the second one, not the first one, but that's what's, that's what's changed around now, so that most people believe that you should change the body to match the gender identity? Or do we just support the person in their convicted state? I mean, the difficulty there is that people's beliefs may never change. And so we're being told that transgenderism is just a kind of natural human uh, attribute. You know, some people are transgender, some are, some are cisgender, some people are gay, some people are straight, you know, and so on. And but the way we used to think about it, and I think a more accurate way of thinking about it, is that this is a kind of uh, body dysmorphia, if you like, where a person has a false belief about their body. Now, let me use the example of anorexia nervosa. You know, anorexia is where uh, a person, usually a young woman, believes they're fat, overweight, and so they diet. Uh, they refuse food, they might die to the point where their life is in danger. Some people will uh, starve themselves to death. But with anorexia, we don't rush in and say, yes, of course, if you believe you're fat, then you are fat, and therefore, how can we help you? Uh, here's a diet that you could take, or could we offer you liposuction, or, or maybe we can do some surgery to remove some of that fat from, you know, we wouldn't think of doing that. So, so why do we think of it with this issue, which our approach used to be quite different? So that's the fundamental question. 
And, and I, think, I think what's happened here is that there's a confusion between gender identity and personality. And uh, part of the problem is that in the past, people have been too strict in inappropriately assigning gender roles. You know, this is a little boy, so he can only play with these sorts of toys. You know, dress in this way. This is a little girl, so she's going to be interested in, in these kind of things. And the fact is that across a broad range of human behavior, there are sexual differences. So there are, there are more, um, more men than women that will end up doing certain professions or more women than men will do other professions. But because there are more women in nursing, it doesn't mean men won't make very good nurses. Because there are fewer women who are working in particle physics, it doesn't mean that some women are go aren't going to be brilliant particle physicists. And so what, what this shows here is you think along the bottom, you can think of any kind of personality tray in the pink. The pink normal distribution is for women and the blue is for, is for men. And you can see that in the middle is a huge amount of overlap. And so this male here, he's still blue, but he's going to be more female-like than most women are. And this girl here, you know, maybe she's a petrol head who likes driving very fast cars at high speeds or, you know, likes putting on a helmet and or perhaps not even doing that and driving a very high capacity CC motorbike. That doesn't mean that she's not a woman. She's just a woman who likes fast cars. In the, in the same way, the, the, Maybe a little boy who likes playing with dolls. What's what's the issue about that? So, so we've made, we've imposed gender roles, and and I think that should make us reflect on the way that we push children into categories. But the fact that a little boy does things that little girls far more commonly do doesn't mean that he's transgender. It just means that he's his personality is at that end of the the spectrum. Uh, the research, when we look at it, the, it's a very good article in New Atlantis. Uh, it's 143 pages. You can get it on the internet on sexuality and gender, and it summarizes a whole lot of scientific findings about um, same-sex attraction and, and gender and so on. But the point is the most frequently heard claims about sexuality and gender are not supported by the evidence that, for example, um, if you take the uh, issue of sexual orientation, the, the kind of claims you hear like um, sexual orientation is biologically determined. So, I, you know, I w in popular words, I was born that way. Is there scientific evidence to support that? No. Sexual orientation doesn't change. Is there evidence to support that? No. In, in many people, it does change over life through different circumstances and so on. So this, uh, this is a, a good example. And these are, these are some of the medical facts. We've not got time to show you all the references and so on. But when we're talking about gender, gender identity often does change over time. And we know that most children who are experience a conflict between their gender, their beliefs, and their biology, if you like, between what they believe they are. Most of them, it, it's a, a passing phase which will change. And it depends pretty much on how you treat them. But 80% but of children who feel they're a, woman, a girl in a boy's body or vice versa will not feel like that way that uh, once they move into adolescence. And so that's another reason not to, to push it early. Uh, transgender people have a higher incidence of mental health problems. There's absolutely no question about that. E virtually every mental health problem. Identical twins don't show concordance. In other words, you, if you take uh, genetically identical twins, 
then you often have one that's gay, one that's straight, one that's transgender, one that's not. What does that tell you? It tells you that it's there may be genetic influences, but it's it's a much bigger story than that. Many seek to detransition, which means that we're seeing increasingly now people who've had hormone treatment or surgery getting to their 20s or 30s and, and it hasn't solved the problems and now they want to change back again. Uh, treatments are untested. It's, it's, it's been shocking the way the medical profession has embraced this without, uh, without evidence. And uh, so when we're talking about these things, these are the kind of issues that we can raise. Uh, this picture is of a meeting I went to in Parliament uh, back in 2017, you can see the date. And the guy in the middle here is a member of Parliament who was uh, concerned about the law changing to allow, um, you know, to give greater rights to transgender people and so on. And he uh, he approached us to say, look, I want you to come along to this meeting, but I don't want I don't want to put you on the platform. I don't want any Christians to speak because I want to bring other people. Uh, who have your same view, but I want you there to support them. And so he got four people. Uh, this one, this was a woman who ran a woman's refuge who was concerned about male to female transgender people coming in and sexually abusing women. This one was the director of an organization called Transgender Trend, which um, was a support group for parents with transgender children who were trying to disown them. Uh, this guy was a trans woman who, so, you know, call me miss or whatever. But he said, you know, you have to understand about this. This is, a, this is an ideology. And then the guy you can't see in the picture, oh no, this one here, you can't see him. He was a psychologist from uh, Bath University who'd had a lot of patients come to him who'd had transgender surgery and hormones and now wanted to change back. And so he wanted to do some research on it. And he asked for permission and the, hospital, and the university said, no, that's, that's um, discriminatory, that's, that's uh, transphobic, you can't do the research. He thought, this is ridiculous, I'm just asking these scientific questions. And so th they brought together a whole lot of co-belligerents who were really concerned about the change in the law, but they're not Christians. And and so what we're starting to see now in Britain is, is there's a swing of the pendulum or a turning of the tide. It was what you were raising before, that it goes so far in one direction, people say, hang on, this is not going to be, be helpful. And I don't know if you follow British... Uh, politics at all, but you might be aware that recently the the First Minister, the Prime Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, resigned. And the, one of the main things that led her to resign was because she tried to, to change the law to a very liberal transgender law. And then it came to the UK Parliament in Westminster, and they said, no, we can't allow this because this is going to lead to all sorts of uh, human rights abuses. And so she then resigned. And that, and that was a major component in it. So what's turning the tide is that is that firstly, feminist and lesbian and gay groups are upset. Uh, people are concerned about a violence by trans women and, and what Nicola Sturgeon, uh, the, 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 the case that really destroyed her credibility was that there was a trans woman who had been put into a woman's prison and then was sexually abusing other people there. And, uh, you know, she, she, and it was clear her law was going to allow this kind of thing to, to happen. Concerns about the undermining of civil liberty. So people being, we call it being no platformed. Germaine Greer, who was a leading feminist, uh, was unable to speak at uh, a university campus because she was she said trans women are not real women, and so they took away her right to speak. You might be familiar with the Harry Potter series. Uh, J.K. Rowling has been targeted and, and 
uh, gagged because she's concerned about this. And so people are concerned about free speech. Cessation, uh, this is the fact that most kids who say I'm trans, if you don't give them hormones, 80% of them change their minds by the time they're teenagers. Detransitioning is, is where people have the treatment and then want to change back again. Um, ROGD, this is rapid onset uh, gender dysphoria in girls. Remember earlier I, I said most girls, uh, in the past it was mainly men who were transgender, now it's mainly girls. And what they're, they're seeing is groups of young girls, particularly in secondary schools in their teenage years, are wanting to transition together from female to male. And it's a condition which now is given the name rapid onset gender dysphoria. And, and people are saying, what's this all about? They can't all be this way. It, it seems to be a peer pressure thing. It's almost like it's a, a fashionable thing that people want to do. Concerns about children having transgender treatments um, and uh, particularly the, the, the way that puberty blockers and hormones and the fact that we haven't done any of the tests necessary and we could be in danger people. So these are just some of the headlines. We're being pressured into sex by some trans women. Now this is a story uh, involving lesbian activists who say that trans women are uh, demanding sex from them and that, but they only want to sleep with real women, not trans women. And so they don't want the law to change because they think they could be exploited uh, more. Uh, sex change regret, gender reversal surgeries on the rise. So aren't we talking about it? So this is the stories of people of, you know, I came to you for help. You cut off all these parts of me and, and did the, these, this uh, uh, surgery. And now I, I deeply regret it. I want to change back. And you tell me there's no way back from it. Uh, this is the rapid onset you can see here. This is a medical journal article reports of adolescents and young girls showing rapid onset just gender dysphoria. So it's been talked about in the literature. Scotland will let pupils change gender age four without their parents' consent. This is Germaine Greer. Petition urges Cardiff University to cancel Germaine Greer lecture. Why? Because she said trans women are not real women. I'm a feminist and they don't know what it's like really to be a woman. How can they call themselves women? They're not real women. And so they say, well, you can't speak at our university. Um, civil liberties cases. This, this is a, a woman on the right here, Maya Forstetter. She lost her job because she tweeted something about transgender that people didn't, didn't like. Uh, the ban on puberty blockers unheld. This is Equalities Minister orders inquiry into massive spike in trans referrals. So this is a, a government minister, not a Christian in the UK, who's saying, I'm really concerned about all these kids going to these clinics. Let's hold an inquiry and stop doing it in the meantime. Um, the link between autism and gender dysphoria. Or this is a Scandinavian example. The Karolinska Institutes announced they were stopping all new hormone treatment in children with gender dysphoria due to lack of evidence of its uh, effectiveness. So th there's, there's a backlash. And I guess what I'm saying to you is, is um, when you're talking about these issues, then raise these kinds of questions. Um, so there's, there's a bit of stuff there on the Christian principles. We, we'd expect transgenderism, it's a fallen world. We recognize the personal experience may be very harmful. Uh, we need to be welcoming communities uh, and so on, not judging people. But at the same time, we mustn't capitulate to transgender ideology. I'm, I'm not going to call you she, no. And I'm going to oppose any change in the law that will force me to do to do that because it's coerced speech.